Would you turn your Bibles this morning to Revelation 22? Last chapter in the Bible. As Sean mentioned, this has been a word, a short phrase that has been on my heart for a number of years. And it's simply this, they will see his face. They will see his face. <clears throat> it, it jumped out to me a number of years ago and uh, have really uh, thought about it and um, not so much as in this last week or two in preparing, uh, but it, it's a powerful verse that should impact our lives. I think it's a tombstone verse for me. If Ken can have seven tombstone verses, I can have at least one. <laughs> so mark it down. They will see his face is worthy of consideration. Revelation 22, four, and we'll be reading it. As Sean mentioned yesterday, uh, there was a memorial service for Dennis Murphy. The Murphys are a wonderful family here at Southside. You can hardly throw a dinner roll without hitting a Murphy. And, um, and he was a great man, a patriarch of that family. And he was well remembered yesterday. So this word today, this message is a message of comfort, I trust, for the Murphys, for Dottie and for Mike and for Steve and Kim and Laura and Murphy, Laura and uh, Ken and Laura and Tim and Kim and families, as well for Brian and Heather Rutland, the passing of his father, Gord. We also have lost um, Last year, Jeannie Tiffany and Judy Jessaroga's son. So a word of comfort to those who are grieve. I can include myself in that. I lost my father 26 years ago, and you still miss the, them. But this is a word of hope and word of comfort to you. Yesterday, Mike, in honoring his father, uh, ended his tribute by saying that he was happy for his dad, for Dennis and actually a little envious too. So my hope for you is, for those who grieve, is that by the end of the message this morning, that you'll be even happier for those who you miss, and maybe a little more envious of them. It's also a word of hope for Christians. This is a word that gives motivation, encouragement, a call for endurance in our walk. And it's also a word of warning to those who don't know Christ. So today we're going to step out of our study in Romans, but truly this passage ties right in with our Roman study. Ken has been laboring to show us Romans 1 through 3, the hopelessness of man in his sin under the wrath of God apart from Christ. And then he, gets, he got to Romans 3, 21, but now a righteousness from God of God's doing has been revealed. And it's by faith to the one who puts his, his or her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and whom God displayed as a propitiation, one who turns aside wrath because God poured out his wrath on our sin on his son so that he could be just in justly dealing with sin and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Romans 4 and 5 talks about how Christ's righteousness has been imputed, like it's a my, counted to my account, even though my sin has been counted to his account. And therefore we have peace with God, Romans 5. And we exalt in hope of the glory of God. And that is a bit of a preview of what's coming, the, the hope of the glory of God. We started Romans 6 recently. And so now we're in Romans 6 through 8, our sanctification. We have justification as the foundation. And now we're living out those, in, those indicatives, those truths that have been uh, we've been blessed with, have been parted to us. We're now living those out in our daily walk. And it's going to culminate in glory. Romans 8 um, is going to culminate in glorification. And so what I would like to do today is give a glimpse of that glorification that will motivate, give hope and endurance, and give wings, as it were, to our sanctification, to our daily walk. Here at Southside, we want to end well. We want to die well. And by 
the accounts yesterday, Dennis Murphy died well. And he is now in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that hope and that um, anticipation gives us motivation as we uh, walk in this world. So let's pray and then we'll start our, with our passage. Father, thank you for this morning, the privilege of opening your word and it is your word. Would you give uh, comfort to those who grieve, to those who um, remember loved ones, give them joy in anticipation of and an understanding of what those saints are enjoying right now. Give us all courage to continue walking with endurance and hope and faith, knowing what's ahead of us and what's awaiting us is the hope of glory, the glory of God. Would you give understanding and clarity this morning in Jesus' name, amen. Revelation 22 is our passage. We're gonna read verses one through five. Revelation 22. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it and his bondservants will serve him. And here's our key verse. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will no longer be any night and they will not have need of the light of a lamp or the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them and they will reign forever and ever. So our immediate context is an angel is showing John, John has a vision of the new heavens and the new earth. And he's describing the environment there in verses one through three and also the first part of five. He mentions the river of life that comes from the throne of God and of the lamb, the tree of life, that there's no curse. There's no longer any sin. In the cross, the power of sin was broken. And as Ken spoke in uh, most recent weeks, our relationship to sin was broken decisively at the cross. And, and as we put our faith in Christ, our relationship with sin in that realm has been broken. And um, in our walk, our sanctifying walk, the, the power of sin is broken, the penalty of sin is broken, and we'll experience one day, and it shows us here, the presence of sin is also done away with. So there's no curse, there's no sin. Um, also in verse three, uh, the throne of God and of the Lamb are there. His presence is described by John and also the light of God in verse five. God is the light of the new heavens and the new earth. There's no need for a lamp because God and his glory is the light. Then in verses three and four, and the last part of verse five, um, John describes our heavenly activities and they can be summarized as serving and savoring diligence and devotion, action and adoration. Here on earth, it's hard to have a good balance of those. In the story of Martha and Mary and Luke, um, Mar Martha was a woman of action and service. Mary was a woman of adoration and contemplation. And it's hard to have that balance here. But in heaven, it's gonna be perfectly matched, perfectly balanced serving and savoring. The kind of service, the d details of that kind of service are not really described, although verse five says they will reign forever and ever. And so part of our service to God will involve reigning and uh, doing some kind of ruling in heaven. The service described in, um, or mentioned here uh, could refer to religious service as in Levitical service, re religious service to God. And that's ultimately, of course, what our service always is. So some of your translations might say his bond servants will serve him. Some of your translations might say uh, so, uh, uh, his bond servants will worship him. And both are, um, are valid and, and actually 
will be present. Let's just look back at uh, Revelation 7 and see how both of these are present, both worship and service. Revelation 7, 9 through 15. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered saying to me, who are the, who, uh, these who are clothed in the white robes? Who are they? And where have they come from? I said to him, my Lord, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. So we see their worship and service, both at present at, at the throne of God. Our focus today, though, not, is not on service, but is on savoring. They will see his face. Wayne Grudem, in his systematic theology, says, more important than all the physical beauty of the heavenly city more important than the fellowship we will enjoy eternally with all God's people from all nations and all periods in history, more important than our freedom from pain and sorrow and physical suffering, and more important than reigning over God's kingdom, more important by far than any of these will be the fact that we will be in the presence of God and enjoy unhindered fellowship with him. This is what's called the beatific vision, that beatific word coming from Latin, meaning the vision that makes us blessed or happy. And truly, this is a vision. And it won't be just a vision, it'll be reality that truly will make us blessed and happy. So let's survey the Bible on this concept of seeing God. And I'd like to do that by contrasting pairs. The Bible says a lot about seeing God, and some of it might seem either contradictory or hard to weigh against other passages. And so I'd like to put these contrasting pairs together for us as we think about seeing God. And here are the four. First, the inability and the certainty of seeing God. Second, the terror and joy of seeing God. Third, the mystery and the clarity of seeing God. And finally, the security and the danger of seeing God. So first, the inability and the certainty of seeing God. How can, it, how can there be inability and certainty? Well, I think we'll hopefully unpack this a little bit. The Bible teaches us that it is impossible for us to see God for at least two reasons. And the first one is his nature, because he is a spirit. So even though scripture uses anthropomorphic terms, God's eyes, his mouth, his hands, his face, as in our passage today, they describe in God in, in terms that we can understand and relate to. Truly, God cannot be seen by humans in his full essence, because he is a spirit. John 1.18 John says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is Christ, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. We understand and get our, in our insight of who God is, especially through the person of Christ. John 4, 24, Jesus speaking to the woman at the well. He tells her, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. 1 Timothy 1, 17, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. In that same book, 1 Timothy 6, 15b through 16, Paul writes, He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. It is impossible 
to see God because he is a spirit. However, God has revealed himself throughout history and throughout the scripture record in ways that we can see, but it's not his full aspect, his full essence, his full appearance. For example, in the burning bush, he appeared to Moses and spoke to Moses through the burning bush and the fire represented his presence. He, rep he showed himself as a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire in the Old Testament to, to protect and lead and guide the Israelites. When the temple was dedicated and uh, the priests went in to serve, they actually couldn't go in because as it says in 1 Kings 8, it happened that when the priests came from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord. That wasn't just a cumulus cloud that just happened to randomly show up. No, that was the presence that was represented the presence of the Lord. And it filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. God also revealed himself in human form. We call these theophanies or Christophanies, uh, an appearance of God, or perhaps uh, in the case of a Christophany, the appearance of Christ in his pre-incarnate form. Those appearances include appearing to Abraham to announce Isaac's birth, Genesis 18, appearing to Joseph, I'm oh, sorry, to Jacob as his wrestling partner in Genesis 32, and to Joshua as the captain of the host of the uh, Lord in Joshua 5. And finally, God has appeared to us and shown us himself in the person of Christ, and that's the most full uh, vis vision or visible way that God has revealed himself. When Jesus was here on earth, he uh, revealed God, as, as I mentioned in John 1. Jesus says to Philip in John 14, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And so in, the, in, the, in one way, by seeing Jesus in his physical form, he was a, a true man in, with a physical body, they did see aspect of God. In Mark 9, this, uh, 1 through 7, Mark describes the transfiguration and how when Jesus revealed some of his glory, he was transformed and his clothes shone so brightly it was like he peeled back a, a bit of his humanity to show uh, his divinity. And a cloud was involved. A cloud overshadowed them and terrified the disciples. Again, that cloud was God's presence. And he spoke out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. So God cannot be seen, even though he has revealed aspects of himself in physical ways that people could observe. He cannot be seen because he is a spirit. He also cannot be seen in his full essence and who he is because of our nature. Our sinful nature and human limitation cannot stand to be in God's full presence as humans, as sinful humans. When Moses met with God, he had a tent, the tent of meeting, and when he would go out there in Exodus, the cloud, again, representing God's presence, would come down to that tent and the Israelites would stand and look at Moses going into the, into the tent. Exodus 33, 11 says, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. So that speaks of the closeness and the intimacy that Moses enjoyed with God. And yet in that same chapter, Moses says, um, Moses asks to see God's glory. And what does God say to him? Verse 19, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me and you shall stand there on the rock and it will come about while my glory is passing by that I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And so Moses did speak to God face to face. There was intimate communion there and friendship and fellowship with God. And yet, even he as a human in his sinful human state could not 
see and stand and live, survive, the un, undiluted and full presence of God without being hidden by the, the hand of the Lord. So the Bible teaches us that it is impossible to see God, but it also gives us certainty that we will see God. It gives great hope. And let me read some of these verses. Job 19, 26, when Job is suffering deeply, he says, even after my skin is destroyed, yet for my flesh I shall see God. Sean read for us this morning Psalm 11, in that verse, for the, the last verse, verse, verse seven, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. Psalm 17, 15, as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. Matthew 5, 8, in the Beatitudes, Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Jesus prays in John 17, his desire for us is that we'll see his glory. He says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory, which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. 1 Corinthians 13, 12, Paul writes, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. 1 John 3, 2, we know that when he, he, Jesus, appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And our verse here, Revelation 22, 4, underscores the certainty that we shall see his face. So there's impossibility, the inability to see God, and the certainty that we will see God. Secondly, the terror and joy of seeing God. When people contemplated or actually experienced being in God's presence, they were often overcome with fear and some even expected to die when they came into, the, into God's presence. And why is that? Again, because of his nature and our nature, his holiness burning brightly. Robin has talked about um, in his profession some kind of a blast furnace that does some kind of thing with chemicals, but just so burning hot and powerful. And without protection, there's no way you could survive in that. And that's just a small example of the burning holiness of God that consumes. Hebrew says our God is a consuming fire, it consumes all unholiness. And again, our nature, our human limitation does not allow us um, to come with confidence before God. So there is terror and yet joy in seeing God. So let's look at first the terror. What, is, what are examples of people being afraid to come into the presence of God? When Jacob anticipated meeting Esau, he, he was uh, still Jacob and a bit of a conniver. And so he uh, tried to, he planned to send a present ahead of him so that Esau would be um, more inclined to accept Jacob. But before he met Esau, he spent that night wrestling with a man. And we believe that's the angel of the Lord. And that would be a pre-incarnate uh, vision or appearance of Christ. And so they wrestled all night and the man um, touched Jacob's hip and put it out of socket, but he held on to him until he would bless him. And what did he say after the man blessed him? Jacob in uh, Genesis 32, 30, Jacob named the place Peniel, the face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. That's, that was unexpected. His life was preserved, even though he had seen God. And so he called that place the face of God. Moses at the burning bush, when God revealed himself in, in the fire of the burning bush, it says in Exodus 3, then Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. When the people of Israel had gone to Mount Sinai in Deuteronomy 5, Moses reminds them of what happened there at Mount Sinai. He says in Deuteronomy 5, the Lord spoke to, your, to you face to face at the mountain from the midst of the fire. So again, 
it wasn't God's undiluted presence. It was through the medium of fire that they, that they realized God's presence. God spoke to you from the midst of the fire while I was standing between the Lord and you. See, I was the mediator at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire and did not go up the mountain. Later in that same chapter, he says, and when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders. You said, behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness. And we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. We have seen today that God speaks with man, yet he lives, yet man lives. Now then, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. Then we will die. For who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and lived? Go near and hear all that the Lord our God says. Then speak to us all that the Lord our God speaks to you, and we will hear and do it. So they were willing to hear from Moses, but they were not willing to hear from God for fear of being destroyed. There's a great story in Judges 13 of Samson's parents. His father's name was Manoah. His mother was unnamed. But the angel of the Lord, again, pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, appears to her, and she's barren, has not had any children. And the, the angel tells her, you will bear a son. And here are the instructions for uh, his life, because he's going to be a Nazarite. He's going to be devoted to God. He will not cut his hair. He will not drink strong drink, um, touch uh, dead bodies. And she goes and tells her husband of this man of God who appeared to her. And Manoah, her husband, prays that the man of God will return. And he does. And um, repeats the instructions and says, be careful to follow what I told your wife. And Manoah wants to offer a meal to honor this man, and yet he doesn't know that he's the angel of the Lord. The angel declines the meal, but he does say, if you want to offer a burnt offering to the Lord, go ahead and do that. So we'll pick up in Judges 13, verse 17. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? So that when your words come to pass about the birth of my son, we may honor you. But the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful or incomprehensible? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord. And he performed wonders while Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came about when the flame went up from the altar toward heaven, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. Now the angel of the Lord did not appear to Manoah or his wife again. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. Verse 22 now. So Manoah said to his wife, we will surely die for we have seen God. But his wife, wise wife, said to him, if the Lord had desired to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor would he have shown us all these things, nor would he have let us hear things like this at this time. Manoah fully expected to die because they had seen a vision, an aspect of God in his holiness. Job, when he was confronted by God at the end of the book of Job, Job says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I repent or retract what I've said, and I repent in dust and ashes. In Isaiah's famous vision of God, what does he say? Woe is me, for I am ruined. I am unraveling because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Why? For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. A similar thing happened to Ezekiel when he had a vision of God. He fell down when he saw a vision of Christ. Even John, the apostle John, when he saw in Revelation 1, his first vision of Christ, what did he do? When I saw it, I fell on my face and heard a voice speaking. Uh, sorry, that was Ezekiel. When I saw him, this is John, I fell at his feet like a dead man. There is terror for humans to come into God's presence. Even Peter, 
when he was fishing and hadn't caught anything all night and Jesus wanted to use his boat, he was willing for that to happen. And Jesus, after teaching, said, let out a little bit and put down your net. And Peter's like, we've been fishing all night and haven't caught anything, but at your word, we'll do that. And the miraculous catch of fish happens. And what is Peter's response? It says in Luke 5, when Simon Peter saw the miraculous catch, when he saw this and even the boat was starting to sink, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. In God's presence, we realize our sin and our lack and our hopelessness before him. And again, in the transfiguration, when the disciples heard God's voice, Matthew 17 says, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God as a sinful human, I might add. Under the old covenant, the rules and the structure of ceremonial washing and things like that, all the old covenant gave the message, stay away. The new covenant says, draw near through Christ. And yet even in the old covenant, there are glimpses of the joy of drawing near. And this brings us then to the, to the next uh, contrast, the, the terror and yet the joy of seeing God. Psalm 16, 11 says, you will make me to know, th- you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forever. Psalm 27, four says, one thing I have asked from the Lord and that, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, What's the purpose? To behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. The psalmist had anticipation and joy of seeing God being in his presence. Under the new covenant, we draw near through Christ and have the hope and joy and anticipation of being in God's presence. Philippians 1.23, Paul says, I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart to, and be with Christ, for that is very much better. He longed to be in God's presence, knowing that in Christ that was going to happen. 2 Corinthians 5.8 says, We are of good courage, I say, and, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and present at home with the Lord. Paul had great hope and joy and anticipation of being in God's presence. So there's the inability and the certainty of seeing God. There's the terror and the joy of seeing God. Let's move thirdly to the mystery and clarity of seeing God. Scripture doesn't give us all the details of what happens in heaven, and so there is still some mystery. We're not totally sure exactly all that's gonna happen, but it's gonna be wonderful. And so we can't be dogmatic about everything, um, but we can still anticipate and, and look forward to it. One of the things that's not totally clear even in our passage this morning, is whose face is he referring to? In the first part of Revelation 22, he's talking about, he mentions twice, the throne of God and of the Lamb. The throne of God and of the Lamb. So why didn't he say they will see their faces? He says in verse four, they will see his face. And so there's, there's a bit of mystery as to whose face is he referring to and why did he refer to it only as a single, singular face? So we can't be totally dogmatic and yet uh, get some clues from scripture. Certainly it'll be Jesus's face that we'll see. He had a physical body when he was incarnate. When he was resurrected, he gained a resurrection body and yet still a body that could be seen and felt and touched, still had the marks of crucifixion on that body. And that's the body that was raised uh, to glory in Acts 1, and he's seated at the right hand of God. He still has that body. And we have the joy and the anticipation of seeing Jesus in his face. <clears throat> in 1 John 3, 2 and 3, John says, we know that when Jesus appears, we will be like him because we will see him, 
just as he is. So we will certainly see Christ. What about the face of God the Father? Uh, some commentators seem to think that that still will not happen, that all of our observation of Christ or of God is mediated through the person of Christ. That happened in, when he was here on earth, and some think that that will continue even in eternity, that God himself, his face, will still not be seen or visible even with resurrected bodies that we'll have. And it's, so it's, it's not clear. If God's face itself, if God the Father himself, if his face will be visible, we'll certainly be in his presence and know that we are in his presence and safe in his presence, but it's not totally clear if his face itself will be seen. I'm actually holding out hope for that. And again, it can't be dogmatic, but it does say his face and um, our resurrected bodies will be different from what we have now and perhaps able to discern and see more than um, Jesus' face. Of course, Je seeing Jesus himself alone is enough. And so there's no disappointment if, if it's not God's face. But to me, it's a little extra, it'll be a wonderful bonus if God's face as well can be seen. And we're not gonna have complete understanding immediately or ever. We're still creatures, and so we will always be seeing the perfection of God as a diamond in all the facets of it and seeing new aspects and appreciating and understanding and growing in understanding and desire throughout all eternity. And that should bring us great joy as well. So no doubt we're gonna be surprised and um, we, don't, we don't know all that, that, that awaits us. It'll be wonderful though. So is it Jesus's face? Yes, wonderful, that's enough. Is it possibly God's face? If it is, I'm gonna say I nailed it um, as humbly as I can, but um, that will be wonderful to see the face of God. So there is mystery, but there's also great clarity. It's unclouded by sin, without the presence of sin any longer, we're gonna see as we've never seen before. 1 Corinthians 13 says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. The ancient mirrors they used back in those days were polished or burnished metal. And so they, you couldn't see a clear defined reflection in them as, as our mirrors do now. And so we don't, don't think that they had the same kind of mirrors that we do because it, it was totally different. Um, so they, they truly couldn't see their face reflected back to them with perfect accuracy. But Paul says, on that day, we will see face to face. There will be no distortion in what we see. What does it even mean to see? There's various aspects of, of the word to see. It can mean to finally understand, oh, I see now, I see, I have understanding. It can, be, it can mean not just the mere act of seeing, but the perception and understanding of what we're looking at. Seeing signifies presence and intimacy and access. Seeing the face of a leader of the nation means you have access to him. And it's the end goal of faith. We walk by faith now, but our, our goal is to walk by sight, and we will see by sight what we only now understand by faith. And it will mean, when we see God's face, it will mean we've been glorified, uh, perfected from sin forever. This seeing is not just a brief glance and then you move on to the next thing. It's a savoring with satisfaction the full glory of God on display in the person of Christ and possibly in the presence of the previously unseen face of God will be ours to behold forever. Can you imagine looking into the face of Jesus? The face of love and acceptance and welcome. The face that we've only 
dreamed about and, and had faith in now, but haven't been able to see, see truly. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9 says, and though you have not seen him, Peter saying to his saints, even, and though you have not seen him physically, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you rejoice greatly with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter is, is applauding his audience. Even though you haven't seen him, you love him and are anticipating the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. How much greater joy uh, will we have when we actually see him face to face? The Him to God be the glory. The third verse says this, great things he has taught us, great things he has done. And great our rejoicing through Jesus, the son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder and transport when Jesus we see. When we see that face, it'll be great, greater joy than we've ever known or understood before. And what's gonna be our reaction? It's the reaction of all citizens of heaven, worship, adoration, singing. We're gonna be praising him. There's some biblical evidence that saints in heaven have an understanding or awareness of what's going, down, going on down here on earth. Revelation six, the um, martyred saints talk about, ask God, when will you give um, vengeance for those who have uh, who, for those who killed us. So there, there is some evidence that saints know or understand perhaps what's going on down here. And yet it seems to be a, a common thought. Oh, my loved one is looking down on me and smiling and watching me play softball and, you know, cheering on the Broncos. You know, I, I think, well, I think that's false because they have so much, so much greater um, affection. Some, something has drawn their affection so much greater. For those of you who are married, you remember when those doors opened in the back of the, of the church and you saw your bride in, in her radiance. That captured your attention. And if your best man had leaned over and said, hey man, I found this barbecue place that we should check out when this, this is over. <laughs> that would be the worst man because you are laser focused and something has captured your attention. You don't have time for the lesser things. And not that those things are bad, but you have this vision and this enraptured uh, anticipation of this beautiful bride walking down the aisle to marry you. And that has captured your full attention. In the same way, I believe, again, you can't be totally dogmatic, but I believe the saints in heaven have little interest and little time and affection for what's going on down here because they're captured by a greater affection. Their, their attention has been willingly and greatly um, diverted and not diverted even, focused on the face, the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in this life, we willingly and joyously give our attention to what captures our hearts. And time flies when we do that. In the same way in heaven, we are willingly and joyously giving our attention to the one who has captured our hearts and, and distractions fall away. Fanny Crosby is a blind, was a blind hymn writer, a prolific hymn writer. And one of her hymns, My Savior, first of all, verse two says this, oh, the soul thrilling rapture when I view his blessed face. Here's a blind woman saying the soul thrilling rapture when I view his blessed face and the luster of his kindly beaming eye, how my full heart will praise him for the mercy, love and grace that prepare for me a mansion in the sky. That's gonna take our attention, is seeing the face of Christ. For Sean's benefit, here's a quote from Spurgeon. In the beatific vision, it is Christ whom they see, and further, it is his face which they behold. 
They shall not see the skirts of his robe as Moses saw the back parts of Jehovah. They shall not be satisfied to touch the hem of his garment or to sit down at his feet where they can only see his sandals, but they shall see his face, by which I understand two things. First, that they shall literally and physically with their risen bodies actually look into the face of Jesus. And secondly, that spiritually their mental faculties shall be enlarged so they shall be enabled to look into the very heart and soul and character of Christ. So as to understand him, his work, his love, his all in all, as they have never understood him before, the clarity of seeing God. Wayne Grudem says this, from time to time here on earth, we experience the joy of genuine worship of God, and we realize that it is our highest joy to be giving him glory. But in that city, this joy will be multiplied many times over, and we will know the fulfillment of that for which we were created. Our greatest joy will be in seeing the Lord himself and in being with him forever. When John speaks of the blessings of the heavenly city, the culmination of those blessings come in the short statement, they shall see his face. When we look into the face of our Lord and he looks back at us with infinite love, we will see in him the fulfillment of everything that we know to be good and right and desirable in the universe. In the face of God, we will see the fulfillment of all the longing we have ever had to know perfect love, peace, and joy, and to know truth and justice, holiness and wisdom, goodness and power, and glory and beauty. So how are these tensions reconciled? Inability? and yet certainty, terror, and yet joy, mystery, and yet clarity. I, I believe they're reconciled in that our resurrected bodies will be able to live forever in God's presence, unhindered, and to know and enjoy him forever. So here on earth, with the bodies we have now, there is terror, there is mystery, there is inability, but then with him forever, there will be clarity, joy, and certainty. Finally, the last pair is the security and the danger of seeing God. And the difference is in who's doing the looking. So first, security. In our text, the people who are seeing his face are identified in verse 3. His bondservants, doulas, slaves, those who, are, who belong to God as his slaves, and not just unwilling slaves. These are the saints. These are the ones who have surrendered. I surrender all. It's the song we just sang. The, uh, those who have surrendered to be his servants, his slaves. There is security in being God's slave because in verse 4, the second part of verse 4 says, his name will be on their foreheads. You put your name on things that are valuable to you and that you own and that you want to identify as your possession. When I was younger, I was part of a nonprofit organization for men training and it had a military structure. So we wore uniforms and so guys are dressed alike. And so you learned to put your name on things, even your socks and underwear, because if you didn't, you may, not, you may not always get them back from the laundry. You put your initials, at least, on those things. And our God is going to put his name on our forehead, signifying that one's mine, and that one's mine, and that one's mine, and that one's mine. You put your name on what you own and what's precious to you. So there's possession and security and intimacy in having God's name on our foreheads. And his name includes his full character, not just a, a text of a name, but all, all of what that text, what that name means, representing him. Being on the forehead could possibly allude to the uh, Old Testament when the high priest was clothed with the various specific robes and et cetera of his uniform. Um, he had a plate, a, a disc of some sort, a plate on his forehead and it had an inscription on it. And the inscription was holy to the Lord. And so in the same way that the high priest was shown as holy to the Lord through that plate on his forehead, 
That means set apart for sacred purpose. He was set apart for God's use and service. In the same way, we will have his name on our foreheads, signifying we are set apart for his use and service. Finally, the danger of seeing God. There's danger in seeing God because unbelievers will also see the face of Christ. But it will not be as their savior, but as their judge. It will not be with the anticipation of forever, but with finality. Revelation 20, several chapters in front of 22 where we are camped out, describes the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. The dead who have rejected Christ will be raised with a resurrection body that's prepared for hell. And they will be judged and they will see the face of Christ, but not again as their savior, but as their judge. John MacArthur describes the scene this way. This is man's last day in God's court. This day of judgment, this tribunal, this court, this trial will not be like the familiar trial, trials held on earth. For those on trial this day will experience a very different kind of court. There will be no debate about guilt or innocence. There will be a prosecutor, but no defender. There will be an accuser, but no advocate. There will be an indictment, but no case for the charged. There will be a swift presentation of the convicting evidence, but no rebuttal. A testimony, but no cross-examination. There will be an utterly unsympathetic judge and no jury. There will be a sentence, but no appeal. A punishment with no parole in a jail with no escape. That's the finality and the danger of seeing God because it will be forever. And it's only for those who have rejected him and um, think that they can live and survive and thrive on their own without him. They will be judged by the deeds recorded in God's book. It says there in Revelation 20, our deeds cannot save us, but they will condemn us then they'll be cast into the hell, which is the lake of fire, and cut off from the life of God and abide under his undiminished wrath forever. That's the finality and the danger of seeing God. But Ezekiel 33 says, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? And so this is a serious note and yet it doesn't have to be for you. And it won't be for those who have their faith in Christ. They have the joy and the security of seeing God's face. But for those who have rejected and gone their own way and think they can do this on their own, there will be a finality and the danger of seeing God's face. So I hope it's been helpful to see the inability and yet the certainty the terror and yet the joy, the mystery and yet the clarity and the security and the danger of seeing God's face. So let's have application. For those who are believers, <clears throat> does the anticipation of seeing God's face change anything about your walk today? Matthew 5, 8 says, blessed are the pure in heart it's the pure in heart that will see God. You get to be pure in heart by having your heart cleansed and washed of sin. And that comes at salvation. And yet that also is worked out in sanctification as, as the um, distractions and sin and things that pull us away from an undivided heart, God exposes and takes away. And we become purer um, not, not that we're adding to our salvation, but we're working it out to show an, a purity of heart. First John 3, again, talks about when he appears, we will be like him just because we will see him at just as he is. And John goes on and says, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself as he is pure. Again, the purity of life is a direct result 
of the anticipation of seeing God. Seeing God has to have an effect on our daily walk. 2 Corinthians 7 says, therefore having these promises of God uh, dwelling among men, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Again, this isn't adding to salvation, but it's working it out in the purity of life. Hebrews 12, 14 says, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification or holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Holiness is a requirement to see God and that's accomplished in salvation. He provides that holiness as Christ's righteousness accredited to me and that's worked out in my life um, in sanctification in my daily walk in anticipation of seeing his face. His face motivates me to live in a way that's holy and pleasing to him. Not to gain his approval, because I have that in Christ, but to, because I have that approval, I want to please him and walk in a way that's pure. Grudem says this, when we consider the fact that this present creation is a temporary one and that our life in the new creation will last for eternity, we have a strong motivation for godly living and for living in such a way as to store up treasures in heaven. And then our application for those who do not know Christ and the, and the call to you is simple. Look to him, look to him. Look to him as the one who provides forgiveness of sins, the one who bore your sin on the cross so that you being dead to sin could live unto righteousness. And by his wounds, you can be healed and free from sin. I mentioned the thrill of seeing your wife come down the aisle. And for me, that happened almost 20 years ago. And the song that was played is a hymn called Look Ye Saints, the Sight is Glorious. And there are several tunes to that hymn and the most triumphant one is called Coronet, if you look at it online. And it's even more triumphant when it's played with a pipe organ and a trumpet, which it was for our wedding. And so that was a sight of earthly glory and that sure caught my attention, I'll say. But the song itself, the hymn, points to a greater glory. I want to read this hymn as we close. Look ye saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now. From the fight return victorious, every knee to him shall bow. Crown him, crown him, crowns become the victor's brow. Crown the Savior, angels, crown him. Rich the trophies Jesus brings. In the seat of power enthrone him while the vault of heaven rings. Crown him, crown him, crown the Savior, King of kings. Sinners in derision crowned him, mocking thus the Savior's claim. Saints and angels crowd around him, own his title, praise his name. Crown him, crown him, spread abroad the victor's fame. Hark, those bursts of acclamation, hark, those loud triumphant chords. Jesus takes the highest station. Oh, what joy the sight affords. Crown him, crown him, King of King and Lord of Lords. Let's pray. God, we are sobered. And yet so hopeful to see your face. Thank you for this. <clears throat> Thank you for this word of hope. you make application in every heart to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.